Welcome. Hey there. Welcome to the fifth program in our 2020 Sawtooth Forum and Lecture Series, Alpine Epics, brought to you by the Sawtooth Interpretive and Historical Association. My name is Anashir Estimus, and I am the Historic Specialist at the Stanley Museum. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that here in Stanley, we are located in the ancestral homeland of the Dukudaka Band of the Shoshone Bannock Tribes. Thank you for joining us this evening. This program is free of charge thanks to our primary sponsors, the Redfish Lake Lodge and the McNichol family, in memory of Roland McNichol, who is an avid series attendee and a steward of the Sawtooths. We thank you for your continued support. As many of you know, the association is a member-based nonprofit. Our mission is to protect and advance the cult natural and cultural history of Idaho's sawtooth salmon river country through preservation and education. Our operations are funded by donations, grants, memberships, and book and map sales at our bookstores, located inside 11 ranger stations, as well as Redfish Visitor Center and Gallery, and here at the Salem Museum. We hope you will consider supporting this series by making a donation in our Sawtooth Bowl, use your credit card in our dip jar, or by becoming a member on the tent to your left. Would any of our current members of Seahaw please raise your hands? Yeah, thank you. Um, if you have any questions about membership or anything else, find someone in a blue shirt, such as this one that I am wearing today, after the program, and they would be happy to help. Tonight, I am introducing Alejandro Flores. Lejo is an associate professor at Boise State University and teaches atmospheric modeling and hydrologic change and modeling. He is also a principal investigator and director of the lab for eco-hydrological applications and forecasting, where the intersections between land, atmosphere, and social decisions are researched. Lejo is passionate about using computational tools and techniques to understand integrated land systems where human activity is coupled with hydrologic, ecologic, and atmospheric processes. Of particular interest are local, regional, and global teleconnections between water, food, and energy networks. Tonight, Lejo will permit present climate and climate change in Idaho's Rocky Mountains. Please welcome Alejandro Flores. Great, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, um, all the protocols that 2020 has brought us. Um, my name is Lejo Flores. Um, I'm faculty at Boise State University in the Geosciences Department, as was, as was mentioned. Um, and um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to Seahoff um, to come and, and, and talk. This is um, such a wonderful break from the places that I normally give presentations, which are usually windowless rooms um, with, um, you know, that are either way too hot or way too cold. Um, and so it's, it's wonderful to be able to be here with you and presenting in front of the beautiful sawtooths. I love this area. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of Idaho. Um, I was telling Lynn just prior, um, our, uh, one of our family traditions in the past few years has been to come up and do a camping trip um, at um, Redfish Lake. Um, and so, you know, we, we love it up here and, um, you know, it, this, this place has a, a special a special place in our, our family's um, heart. So, um, so today what I'd like to do is um, talk about a few things. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, um, about well, this sounds bad, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about myself and sort of how I got here um, and how I got into regional climate change um, and climate change modeling. And then what I'd like to talk about specifically with respect to climate and climate change in the Rocky Mountains here are today those things that, you know, what do we know about climate change in the Rocky Mountains in Idaho? What are the things that we know? What are the things that we're uncertain about? And then finally, um, what are the things that we don't know about climate change in this region? Um, and then, you know, probably what I'll do is end a little bit early because I know that this is a topic that um, frequently a lot of people have a lot of questions about and a lot of interest in. And so, you know, my hope is to not give, you know, a standard professorial hour-long seminar, um, you know, but but instead to, to to end a little bit more briefly to give folks an opportunity to, to ask some questions and to, to, to maybe have a bit more of a discussion. So, um, um, I actually, I'm a Westerner. I think of myself very much as a Westerner. Um, I was, uh, 
born and raised um, in, in the Denver metropolitan region. I grew up in Golden, Colorado, for any of you that um, know about Colorado. Um, so right at the foothills between um, uh, the Denver metro area and the start of the Colorado Rocky Mountains, the start of the Front Range there. Um, those of you that are Coors drinkers or you know Coors Banquet, um, that's that's right where we are. That's what we're usually known for. That's that's the first thing that comes to people's minds when you say Golden, Colorado. Um, my dad was actually a geologist. My dad immigrated from the Philippines in um, the 1950s. He was a geologist. Worked for the U.S. Geological Survey uh, for. 35 years, actually starting in the 70s and retiring just about 10 years ago, in fact. Um, so all of that is to say is that, you know, as I grew up, um, you know, there was a lot of looking at mountains and, and swerving off the road to look at road cuts and hearing a lot about um, the formation of, of the western United States, um, how it used to be an ancient um, seabed and the processes like uplift and, and tectonic motions that, that created the Rocky Mountains over tens of millions of years. Um, and growing up in, in Golden and in Denver in the 1980s and 90s, um, the other thing that I was sort of very steeped in was the rate of change in that landscape. Um, this was an era in which, you know, Denver went from being sort of a, you know, eh, regionally largish city to being kind of a bigger me metropolitan city. It went from sort of one or maybe two professional sports teams to, you know, having them all basically in the span of a decade. Um, it became a, a place that people wanted to live because it was so close to the Rocky Mountains and, and so close to, um, you know, amenities that, that people um, really appreciated having like mountains and, and water, right? And so this this sounds awfully familiar to those of us, right, in, the, in this neck of the woods. And people were moving, um, having second homes in places like Buena Vista, which locals call Buena Vista, um, uh, Estes Park and, and other places like that, right? So so I, I was, I grew up in a landscape that was very rapidly changing um, and, and I observed that and it obviously made a big impression on me because um, I, I, I'm very much interested in how those same processes are maybe playing out here in, in Idaho. Um, I got my undergraduate at Colorado State University in um, civil and environmental engineering. Um, it, part of that was, was that kind of push to, to get a marketable job and be able to go and, and um, you know, do do a major where you could get a job at the end and I was told that civil engineers were always going to be needed um, which I think is true um, and um, but you know still I had a lot of interest in in water right I mean one of the things that we understand in the western United States is that this is fundamentally a water limited area right I mean it's not that the you know that that there's not lots of water in some places it's that you know when you look at the West as a whole um, you know, there's sort of insufficient water for the kinds of things that we would like to do, like grow crops and, um, you know, to, to feed the world, right? So the, the water is sort of very uh, tightly concentrated in places like the mountains. Um, so I very much developed a passion for studying water as an undergraduate. I stayed at Colorado State for my master's degree, and then I went on, um, decided I, I needed to leave the West for a period of time in part to get an appreciation. So I, I went to MIT to do my PhD um, and had a wonderful time in Boston. I, I love the city of Boston. Um, but there's a lot of things about me that um, that are, are Bostonian just from my time there. I won't tell you whether or not driving is one of them. Um, uh, but, um, you know, but it was a really, it was a really great opportunity to, to be at that place. But um, you know, obviously, sort of as I finished my PhD, the West beckoned again, and so I had the opportunity to come to Boise State in 2009. Um, and you know, it was just it was there was a lot of things, you know, not surprisingly, that were very similar about um, this region and about Boise to where my my wife is from Golden as well. We're actually high school sweethearts. Um, but um, there's there's a lot about this region that is sort of very similar to where we grew up, right? So it was very comfortable. So, um, so in in my studies, right? I I I 
was at sort of MIT, the kind of techie kind of place, and developing a lot of quantitative and mathematic and computational skills to study um, water and climate. And so that's kind of the toolbox I brought with me and the perspective of, of who I am and, and where I grew up sort of informing that. And so um, I think it, in a lot of ways it was only natural that when I got to Boise State I would sort of turn my eyes towards the mountain and want to use that toolkit to understand how climate and climate change are influencing these mountain landscapes that you know all of us love so much um, and to also understand what they might look like um, in the coming decades or in the next century. So at Boise State, um, I'm faculty in the geosciences department. Um, I have a, a research group, the, the LEAF lab, um, the lab for ecohydrologic and applications and forecasting. It's a backronym, right? We, we picked something that was cool and worked backwards to what the name of the lab should be. Um, <laughs> So, and, and, and what we really do is we try to, we do a couple of things. We try to, you know, advance our, you know, our understanding, the basic science. We advance our, our mechanistic understanding, the physical laws of how these landscapes work, right? So the, you know, the, the mathematical equations, we're trying to refine how well we know them and how well we can use them to to predict how the future might respond, but also to be able to bring that expertise and, and make better predictions, produce data sets that are useful for our, our agencies and our communities to be able to adapt and respond to climate change. So my research group, our students, um, so some of the things that they do, for instance, uh, they, they run numerical and computational models that, that predict um, either in the past or in the future what the climate might look like. Um, and that includes things like the, the, the temperature, the precipitation, the runoff, the snowpack, the infiltration of water into, into the ground, and even sometimes the movement through the ground. And we're, we're doing that not through, we're doing that, um, again, according to those kinds of laws of physics as we understand them, right? So we're trying to model the processes as they happen, not just necessarily kind of make extrapolations about, well, what's been happening lately and how is, if we extrapolate that forward into the future, right? We're trying to use a toolbox that's grounded in, in physics and biology and chemistry to make those predictions. So a lot of our students will be using those tools, but they'll be working very closely with some of these state, federal agencies, municipalities to produce data sets that, that answer questions, right? Um, so organizations like the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, um, the Idaho Department of Water Resources, you know, they want to know, um, you know, what will stream flow in the Salmon River look like um, most years, 80 years from now, right? Um, they, they might want to know, you know, how might, how might precipitation change? And, and not just in amount, how much, you know, snow versus rain are we going to get, you know, 10, 20, 30 years out into the future? Um, so, and when they're finished, those students actually wind up frequently in those agencies and organizations you know, working there because they have this great tool set. They know what the agencies need and the kinds of questions that the agencies ask. Um, and, and they're able to sort of piece together the, the data um, and the, the, the ground-based data, the models, um, in order to sort of help those agencies make better decisions, right? So, um, so it's about not just kind of improving our knowledge and making better predictions. It's also about sort of training those students and, and putting them into agencies to be able to help solve these challenges and help, you know, get the agencies um, the kind of human capacity they need to be able to, to manage our systems in the future. So that's a little bit about... Um, my research group and the kinds of things that um, that that we that we do and and really importantly I think uh, about um, the students the students um, and postdocs that are engaged in the work and and where they ultimately end up. 
So, okay, so now let's pivot to talking about, okay, so, you know, all of you are here in part because you're interested in, in climate change um, in the future in Idaho's Rocky Mountains, right? Um, as, as am I, right? That's, that's, that's what the title of the talk is, and that's what I'm here to talk about. So what I'd really like to talk about are those things, again, those things that we know. What do we know about um, global climate change and how it will affect um, uh, the, the Rocky Mountains in Idaho and the, Rocky, the Western United States more, more generally? What are those things that um, you know, we have uncertainties in, that we maybe have an idea, but we you know, need to constrain a little bit better? And what are those things that we really don't know? Okay, so let's start off with the things that we know. And the things that we know are probably the things that you already know. It's gonna get warmer, right? Um, so um, obviously, you know, global climate change, global warming, the, the mean annual temperature for the, the planet Earth is expected to rise in the next 100 years. By the year 2100, um, it could be as much as 4.3 degrees Celsius um, warmer, and that's spatially averaged over the Earth, so over the entire globe, right, if you took its average temperature, about 4.3 degrees Celsius warmer is maybe the latest estimate of, of where we might be by the year 2100. Okay, so, but that's, you know, the, the global temperature, the global mean or average temperature often doesn't really tell us much about, you know, about how a system like, you know, is that what we can expect, right? Is every day going to be 4.3 degrees Celsius warmer? And the answer is almost universally no. It depends completely on where you're at, um, how far you are away from the equator, right? How far north or south you are away from the equator. Um, it depends on, you know, how far you are from large water bodies. And it depends on, um, how, you know, what the, what the variability of the climate is in the region you're at. And the region we're at in, in the Rocky Mountains here is very variable from a climate perspective, right? So we're standing here, what's the elevation here? 6,200. 6,200. And um, there in the Sawtooth, right, we have peaks that, that are over 12,000 feet. That's a lot of variability in, in not that far of a distance, right? It's, it's maybe tens of miles to, um, you know, to add up to 6,000 additional feet of, of elevation. If you look out around, you know, there's, it's not just, you know, it's not just a steady increase in elevation. There's a lot of variability. If you look, you know, at these beautiful hill slopes behind you, there's variability in that vegetation cover. Um, there's variability in, um, you know, the the soils that are underneath that vegetation, there's variability in the rocks that that form those hills. So we have a lot of variability here, right? And that, that variability is sort of what creates a lot of the climate that we observe. You go up higher in elevation, the lower in temperature on average. So in mountain areas, and in Idaho's Rockies in particular, what can we expect in terms of how that global warming, how that global increase in average temperature will express itself? Um, so there's different ways, um, but one of the, you know, one of the answers is that yes, we will have warmer summers, and many of you that came up to talk to me before the talk already mentioned that, right? That summers are already sort of noticeably warmer than they have been in maybe, you know, the past decade, and, and even I suspect if you talk to people that have been around since the 80s, even much warmer since then. What's perhaps, you know, even more startling is you know and if you look at the if you look at the data there's maybe been about in the past 30 years maybe about a, a half a degree increase celsius that is so that's somewhere around you know one and a half degrees i'll wait for this truck to go by one and a half degrees fahrenheit warmer over the past 30 years in terms of daily high temperatures right daily average highs in about this in the summertime What's even more startling is the increase in the daily minimum temperature, right? And if you look at the trends in daily minimum temperatures in mountain areas um, in the West, but more generally across the world, we've seen very large increases 
um, in in nighttime low temperatures, right? And, and that's, I think of that as often one of the things that maybe confounds people's perception of climate change is very few among us get up early in the morning, you know, early enough, like right before the sun gets, you know, the sun comes up to understand, you know, how cold it is or how much warmer it is, right? And, and a lot of times too, that doesn't necessarily look like it's warm in, in the morning. It looks like instead of being, you know, maybe 14 degrees um, Fahrenheit, it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit. It's still cold, but it's four degrees warmer than, than it sort of typically is, if that's, if that's the normal. So, so why is that potentially an issue? And, and here's, here's where we as, um, as climate scientists, you know, we, we come at this from, from many different angles. I come to it from sort of a water angle. Why does an increase potentially in nighttime low temperatures make a big difference in terms of the landscapes we live? Well, there's many different ways. I'll give you one example that um, I as a Coloradan and many of you up here maybe have an appreciation for. So one reason is that um, there are these, these little beetles that can get into the bark of trees, right? They carry with them a fungus, um, and that fungus um, disrupts the sap flow in the trees and can ultimately um, kill those trees. They turn um, grayish blue and then um, they, they, they die. Um, and part of the reason, and so these are bark beetles, right? Many of you know what I'm talking about already. Um, and so many, an important reason, there's a huge, a tremendous bark beetle outbreak um, in Colorado in the early 2000s. And part of the reason for that is that the nighttime low temperatures have been um, one of the, part of the ecology of those bark beetles is that um, very cold nighttime temperatures are sufficient to sort of freeze those beetles and, and kill them, right? So it kills enough of them. You can think of this as like, um, a, a good analogy for it is, is cold-induced social distancing of bark beetles, right? So um, if you kill enough of them, you break their ability to reproduce and get into trees and kill them. And when you don't get those cold temperatures at nighttime, one of the things that happens is that you expect more, um, you expect more bark beetle outbreaks and more severe and spatially extant or large infestations of bark beetles, right? That's a, that's a challenge, that's going to be a challenge here. Um, so it's not just the, the change in temperature that's, that's problematic in terms of climate change, it's the impacts of those changes in temperatures on the things and the systems that we care about. So getting to those impacts, right? So what are some other things that we know about how climate change will influence the Rocky Mountains here. So if we know that it's going to be warmer, and we know that that, that increase in temperature is going to occur both in sort of the low end, um, in the daily minimum temperatures, as well as in the high end, in terms of daily maximum temperatures, um, what is that, what are the ramifications for things like our snowpack? And the, the as you might expect, the sort of, the, the, the straightforward answer is that, um, well, there's a couple different answers. One is that as the precipitation is coming in, if um, the temperatures are warmer, you would expect that um, that transition between snow and rain is going to move higher, right? Because you have a lower sur or a higher surface temperature, right? Um, and that temperature decreases in elevation, but if that temperature is higher, right, that transition, that rain snow line will move higher in elevation than it was kind of historically, right? So we might expect a, a shift in that rain snow line to go up um, on that precipitation side, right, as precipitation is coming in. And so, um, again, what are some of the impacts, what are some of the impacts of that? Well, first of all, um, it's, it's not just the, the change in the snow line, right? So we, we might expect an increase in the snow line and it may be up to 100 meters higher, right? So that's about 300 feet in kind of the seasonal snow line um, in, in some of the middle of the road climate scenarios. 
Um, so it's not just the shift in snow line, but it's actually the, the ecosystems and the vegetation communities that depend on that sort of, on that snow cover um, on an annual basis. And so the, the, the key, if you can think of like sort of indicators of climate change, right? Um, some of the mountain wildflowers that are out there, right, are very dependent on, you know, you can actually time them very closely when they emerge, when they flower, to the disappearance of snow, right? So snow disappears in something like 19 days later, some of these flower species, some of these wild wildflower species will will bloom. Um, and so, you know, that that's just sort of an indicator, right? Um, all of these kind of communities, all these vegetation communities, um, our, our mixed forests, our, um, our shrubland systems are very kind of finely tuned to um, the, the climatological variation in, in precipitation and, and how that precipitation arrives as either snow or rainfall. So as the rain-snow transition shifts, not only does it potentially have ramifications for, um, you know, down in Sun Valley, the, you know, um, or in the backcountry here, how many ski days you have, um, it has really important implications for, for instance, our, our forest ecosystems and the trees that depend on a certain timing of, of water release from the snowpacks. Um, down where we live in Boise, what are some of the ramifications of that change in snowpack? So, so this change in snowpack is actually a really big focus of a lot of research that we're doing at Boise State. So if we get more precipitation as, um, as rain than snow in the future, um, we have a bunch of these reservoir systems, right? So Anderson Ranch, Arrow Rock, Lucky Peak on this side, American Falls on, you know, to the south of us, um, that sort of depend on or are built on um, a very um, strong assumption of when, you know, how much, how much of that water storage is snow and the timing of that change in snowpack, you know, the timing of its melt and runoff into r rivers and to deliver to reservoirs. Right, so you can you can think of our reservoir system not only here in Idaho but throughout the West as being, again, very finely tuned to a very specific set of conditions with respect to, you know, snow accumulation and snow melt, and so one of the big and fascinating challenges that climate change poses for not just the Rocky Mountains but basically all of irrigated agriculture in the Western U.S. are how do our or maybe are, are our reservoirs sufficiently capable of adapting to these changes in snow regimes, right? Um, will we get too much runoff too quickly and will we not be able to store it? Will we basically have to be flushing water downstream to avoid overtopping the dams and flooding cities like Boise, Denver, um, Salt Lake and, and other places like that? Will we have to, to release that water um, so quickly that it won't be able to be used by irrigators. And what does that do to our food systems? Okay, so, so those are the things that we kind of know, right? And those are already places where we are, you know, very much trying to um, work with, our, um, work with our, our partners in the agencies to understand and, and help them sort of be able to adapt their, in, their physical infrastructure, right? Um, how how their dams work, um, but also their um, their sort of social in, infra, infrastructure. So how they manage dams and reservoirs, how they how they manage um, forests, how they think about um, things like fire risk and, and mitigation, how they think about um, the potential for outbreaks of things like bark beetles. Those are kind of the places where there's a lot of work already being done in academia and in the agencies to try and help those agencies um, not mitigate the climate change, but actually a adapt to what is likely already happening and going to continue to happen in, in, the, in the future. Okay, so where, where do we have uncertainties? Um, and, and the one that is really big and sort of keeps me up at night 
um, is just the, the sort of year-to-year -year variation in the total amount of precipitation that we're going to get, right? And, and, and this, this gets into sort of some complex atmospheric stuff, and I'll, I'll lead you through my thought process and how this works and how the, how the climate science community thinks about this. So, so the air globally we expect to warm right over the next hundred years and um, an important property of that warmer air is that warmer air holds more water holds more water vapor right it can hold more molecules of of water vapor than it than um, cooler air right and, and most people experience this through condensation right so you have um, you know a single pane window we have I live in the north end in Boise we have single pane windows on the front um, on cold days when it's cold outside and warm inside, right, um, what will happen is, is water will condense on the windows. Um, and so, importantly, right, um, it's not just kind of linearly, but warmer water actually holds, the, the shape of the curve is sort of, is exponential. It goes like this, um, not just a straight line. And so warmer, warmer air will, will hold more water. So if warmer air holds more water, the oceans can evaporate more water into the air, but they can't just keep, the atmosphere can't just keep accumulating precipitation, right? We can't keep stuffing water into the atmosphere. So that water, what goes up must come down. So the opposite of that evaporation term is precipitation. So globally, what we hydrologists predict is that not only will um, the planet warm, but globally, and, and again, this is sort of very globally averaged, we would expect more precipitation to happen in a warmer future. Now, at first you might say, well, that's great. Um, you know, at least there's some benefits to, to climate change in terms of more precipitation. But um, as much as the distribution of how the change in temperature is variable throughout latitude and throughout altitude and with land cover, how precipitation changes in the future is even more uncertain, right? So, um, and, and it's a product of a lot of other things that we, we don't know, right? So um, I presume some of you might have heard by now the term polar vortex, right? So, um, so there's this idea that that there's um, up at the North Pole and at the South Pole, there's a, a, a there's the atmosphere is sort of rotating around this vortex, and where that vortex is can kind of shift in time, um, and it turns out that one of the things that causes that polar vortex to shift, and sometimes it actually splits apart. Um, what causes that polar vortex to shift increasingly, we believe, is a lack of ice cover at the North Pole, right? So as things like ice cover retreat from, right, so somebody handed me an article about, um, um, you know, ice sheet loss um, that, that's ongoing and is making the news again, um, that increases that variability of that polar vortex and causes some pretty extreme and profound changes in in who experiences really cold winters right so um so as as some folks might have um might already be aware that um the siberian winter this past winter was exceptionally warm like way way warmer than anything we've sort of experienced and, and that in part is a consequence of we believe the fact that ice is sort of disappearing from the north pole that's causing that polar vortex to be more variable. And that means that there's these big waves of, of um, cold weather pattern where you're either in really, really warm conditions or really, really cold conditions. And that line, right, those wavy lines kind of shift as that polar vortex shifts. So the big concern that we have in the future with respect to precipitation is that we might get um, more globally, but there's more variability on a year to year basis with how it's distributed, right? So we might see, you know, some years that are exceptionally wet, 
what year 2017 right so just a few years ago we had an enormous enormously wet winter and they may be followed very quickly by droughts of record right so so years in which we get very very little precipitation the following year right and so it's that variability that our systems are our natural systems, our ecosystems, as well as our human systems, our dams, reservoirs, canals, and, and water rights systems are not really well set up to be able to handle. So that's what I spend a lot of my time researching, is trying to understand how precipitation might change in the future. So that's the big thing where there's uncertainties and where there's a lot of need for us to kind of refine our understanding with respect to how the world is working. Okay, so the last thing, what do we have you know, very little understanding of? Um, and this, in some senses, I do a little bit of research in this realm and am increasingly doing more. Um, well, it's the people, right? Um, increasingly, we as, as climate scientists are understanding that um, we can't treat um, the global climate system as just a natural system that it's actually the, the people on planet Earth that are exhibiting and exerting a really important influence on our planet. And so um, a lot of my research actually focuses on, you know, more how will people respond to climate change and how do those responses, right, how will they do things like grow crops differently, manage water differently, and do any of those, um, do any of those changes in behavior go back and affect the natural system, right? So as we, as we manage water differently, as, as, as growers change the crops, as they expand the length of their growing system, growing season, how does that potentially change how much water is available? Um, and, um, and not just for growing crops, but also for um, other things like recreation, fisheries, Right, and so, um, so what I, where there, where we have very little knowledge, and where there's increasingly a lot of attention paid to is, what are people going to do? You know, what, how is, how, how are we going to respond globally? How are we going to respond regionally, and even on a sort of city by city basis, to what climate change ultimately brings us? Right, and um, that's where I don't have a lot of answers, but where, but where. What we do know about that is that um, increasingly conversations with everybody, right, engaging people in the in the research process, understanding how people might respond, going out and having surveys and focus groups, and talking to stakeholders like ranchers, farmers, um, forest rangers, and others, and understanding how they're changing their behavior in a changing climate is really critical. So the thing that I want to leave you with. Um, in, in terms of that arc of research and what we, what we know well, what we have some uncertainties in and what we don't know, is that increasingly all of you and all of us are going to have to be part of this conversation about how we ultimately will, will respond to climate change and the kinds of things that we will do because it's, it's critical not just um, to make our communities adapt or help our communities adapt, to be um, thriving and resilient in the face of climate change, but it's also important from the research side to be able to incorporate and include um, the things that people perceive, the things that they know, and the ways that they behave into our models, into our computational models of how the climate is changing. So with that, um, I want to thank you all again very much for the opportunity to come up and talk to you. And I would be more than happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah. Would you discuss the effect of climate change on our sockeye and Chinook fish? Yeah. So uh, the question is, is um, what will be the effect of climate change on sockeye and Chinook? So there's... Um, so... It's probably not going to be great. Is the, is the quick answer. Um, so the um, the big challenge, right? So so one of the big one of the big things that we worry about in terms of, of warming temperatures is the impact of warming air temperatures on the water temperatures, right? And salmonids in particular um, are are very sensitive to um, uh, to 
to changes in, in, in river temperatures um, because it affects their sort of sp spawning and the success of their, their, their red beds, right, um, in terms of, of the success. So that's, there's, there's some direct consequences for, for water temperatures on Salmonids right there, right, on the, on the spawning cycle. The other one that is indirect but equally important is that, um, again, I mentioned those wildflowers that can some, you know, there's a lot of things in nature that are s s shockingly timed well to um, things like the disappearance of, s of snow, the crossing of certain th temperature thresholds. Um, among them, um, there are certain uh, macroinvertebrates, right, so stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, that those salmonids feed in in our terrestrial ecosystems. Um, well, not the salmonids, but their, their food, right? Um, that um, as the temperatures warm, kind of emerge more quickly, right? So um, some sto stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies are very sensitive to something that we call the growing degree day. It's actually something that farmers use, right? So it's an accumulation of heat that, that is associated with the emergence of, um, of, of these insects from moving through their different sort of life cycle stages. Um, so one of the concerns is that um, warmer spring temperatures will, will quicken the pace of the emergence of some of these, um, some of these invertebrates. Um, the, the, fish, uh, the fish that rely on them for food um, may not be sort of ready for them to emerge. And so there may be kind of this ships passing in the night effect where they're not able to sort of, um, you know, those, you know, they're not able to sort of um, find the food that they rely on, right? And, and that their productivity, so the amount of those fish that the availability of the ability of them to sort of grow larger and, and reproduce is reduced. And that ultimately sort of affects what we call the, the, the lower trophic levels, so the bigger fish that eat fish, right? So there's also kind of important indirect consequences for, um, for all of our aquatic ecosystems that depend, that depend on sort of the, the um, aquatic invertebrates for, for food. So, those are kind of the direct consequences. The others, though, the, so this, the ones that actually may get better um, are, are that as we, shift, as we shift globally um, from a sort of carbon-based um, transportation and energy system to more renewables, I think that we will, and we've already started to see this, right, with Congressman Simpson actually sort of broaching the topic of the lower Snake River dams, we may see um, it become much more viable to think about removing some of those dams that, that pose um, uh, barriers to migration of these fish. So that's where there's actually an opportunity as we, as we move away from and towards kind of a more distributed energy system that doesn't necessarily rely on these huge dams to produce lots of hydropower. Yeah, those are those are great questions. So, two questions. One was, what is the effect of um, what is the effect of climate change on um, the the Snake River Plain aquifer in particular? Um, and in addition to that, um, is there any relationship with um, a lot of the the pollution, the water quality issues that we're starting to see in places like the Magic Valley, associated with um, in particular um, a, a lot of dairy production over the past couple decades? Um, so this, the, the Snake River Plain Aquifer is a fascinating system, and it is one of those where it is, um, it, it is what we would call sort of a coupled natural human system. So the aquifer is this big hunk of, um, of basalt. It's got big fractures and holes in it. 
As, as far as aquifers go, it's what we call very transmissive. So water moves through it exceptionally easily. Um, so, and it actually is probably more sensitive to climate change than um, some of the other aquifers throughout um, throughout the western U.S. precisely because of that. So a lot of the water that gets into the Snake River Plain aquifer comes from um, basically sort of, um, you could think of it as sort of over irrigation in the East Snake Plain, right? So um, historically there, um, as, as folks settled the East Snake River Plain, they, they used flood irrigation, um, you know, so the plants uptake, the crops uptake some amount of water, and then some amount of water infiltrates down. Um, and so the Snake River Aquifer actually was increasing in terms of the water stored in it for about 100 years before people started to switch to center pivot um, irrigation in about the 70s or so. Um, and so it relies maybe more than other aquifers on water that's coming down off of, um, you know, off of the mountains um, to be used as irrigation and to be recharged into the aquifer. So um, the East Snake, um, so Idaho Water, I, IDWR is very interested in that question. But at the same time, you know, one of the questions is, is and, and one of the things that's um, coming up across the West and throughout the world are, can we think about um, those aquifers as potentially reservoirs for storing water because they are not sensitive to evaporation, which is higher when the temperature is warming. So can we develop ways of recharging the aquifer? Can we do what's called managed aquifer recharge to store water in the subsurface when we could use it later? That brings in the water quality issues, right? Because um, it's, it's not so great to be storing water in an aquifer that's ultimately getting polluted. Um, and so, so certainly in this case, climate climate change and water quality pose really important issues because you know we we need to start thinking about in terms of climate adaptation managing our aquifers more actively but we also need to think of them as as being very sensitive to um to pollution whether it's via dairy farms or other kind of emerging contaminants um you know, like uh, personal care products and things like that. So, so um, I run the uh, NOAA National Weather Service uh, station here in Stanley and have for decades. And what I've seen is in the late 70s, we had 25 frost-free days. Now in the 2000s, we're in 70 plus frost-free days. And I also, of course, monitor the low temperatures, the high temperatures, the precipitation, our precipitation, you would have thought with the warming, would be on the increase, but we've only really had one year of increase. Otherwise, it's all very stagnant, but our temperatures keep getting warmer. Uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we never, ever saw temperatures in the 90s. Now we've had four years of temperatures in the 90s. It's happening very fast. That's my point, yeah. is it's happening very fast here in the, this country. Yeah, and, and this is consistent with what we see throughout mountain regions of the world is that mountains, the mountains and the poles, the high latitudes, tend to be places where we're experiencing climate change at the most rapid um, pace. And, and there's a couple of important reasons for that. So, you know, the, the simplest way that we sort of think about um, um, the Earth's, the atmosphere's circulation as, as a way of redistributing heat from the equator to the poles, right? So the things like, you know, Hadley cells, um, the things that create really big thunderstorms in the tropics, um, those are kind of um, fluid mechanical ways to efficiently take more energy and excess of energy at the equator and kind of shunt it to the poles, right? So, so what's happening with climate change is that we're sort of speeding those up, right? So we're, we're changing, we're increasing the rate at which we're sort of shunting energy from the equators to the poles, meaning that, you know, those high polar places and those places that are higher in the mountains are going to be receiving, you know, that heat at a much more rapid pace than potentially places like in the equator. So, and the comment on precipitation on, on one, so this is actually like something that's very much debated because 
it's really tough to see any change in the observational record. Um, so some background, precipitation is very hard to measure. So kudos to you, like it's, it's very hard to measure quantity. Um, and and it's, it's got what we call a lot of noise. There's a lot of precision issues with measuring precipitation. So when you factor that in, it's very tough to see any trends in precipitation through time. Um, but the physics kind of predicts that they should be at least a, a slight increase. And so the big debate is that, you know, we can't see it, but it's also supposed to be sort of a relatively small increase. And so a lot of what the community is interested in is, okay, if there are increases in precipitation, where are we most likely to see them? When are we most likely to see them? And how are we most likely to see them? So, but that's, that's great. I'd love to follow up too about. Uh, a second question yep. is, the, the sawtooth country in the high country here is a reservoir of cold water for the Salmon River and the Snake River and the Columbia River. Uh, and as we get less and less cold here and less and less snow, we're going to be less of a reservoir. However, we still remain very, very important for those anadromous fish. Yeah, so yeah, the, the comment is about kind of the, so, um, in, in, in hydrology, one of the things, uh, you know, we're all often kind of trying to think about um, marketing ourselves to other earth sciences. Um, and, and what we have often referred to the mountains as is the water towers of the world, right? Um, and they really are, right? Mountain regions of the world. Actually, I think it was in a, in a paper, a colleague of mine at, at University of Colorado coined that phrase, water towers of the world. And it's a good one. Because, you know, if you look globally throughout the world, actually, something like a billion people on planet Earth, you know, a, a good chunk of them actually on the Indian subcontinent, rely on water from seasonal snowpacks to, to persist, right? Like, we rely on, on, on snow runoff from snowpack in order to grow crops, in order to drink, in order to maintain communities that are downstream. And so... Um, that's a billion people that are sensitive to any shifts in those snow regimes. Um, and, you know, and that includes the ecosystems that they depend on as well. So that's a great comment. Thank you for that. Yeah. Hello. Um, so uh, I've been hearing about how, especially um, in urban areas, Yeah, so th this is an interesting thing that is, you know, um, and, and I, you know, my fear is, is that, um, and, and you, you started to see some, some folks um, making these claims on, on Twitter, in fact, that, so there has been a sort of, we expect a bit of a decrease in emissions this year because of the pandemic and because some industries, um, especially in China, you know, China imposed a very severe lockdown for an extended period of time. And so we do expect to see at least, um, if not a decrease in emissions, then certainly a slow, uh, 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 slowing in the growth of emissions. Um, and, you know, the, the cynics out there have already latched onto that to sort of say, well, if we shut down the global economy and only realize a small decrease in emissions, then what's the point in doing it, right? Um, and so and I think that, that, I'm not making that claim, but, let, um, but I think it will be interesting to sort of see, and, and it, I think one of the interesting things that will come out of the pandemic is how does it fundamentally shift how folks work, right? Um, you know, does it mean that, um, you know, we need to, I, I think one of the things that's happened certainly um, in academic circles, right, is that I, I haven't been on a plane since early March, and I actually now sort of like not traveling. And so I think that my behavior in the future will be more sort of hesitant to travel via air, via air because one, you know, it, on, a, on a sort of family guy level, it cuts away from time with the family. B, I don't, you know, I'm increasingly seeing that it hasn't necessarily 
I haven't missed a lot other than seeing friends by not being at some of those conferences. Um, and more importantly, it's cut down on my emissions, my own personal emissions, which you know is is important. And so, um, so it'll be interesting to see how how the the pandemic maybe drives some innovation in those things that that allow us to sort of think about um, managing our our global emissions differently um, through the use of technology. seeing a more shift towards more deciduous forests. Is that, is that a potential for um, these climates as well? Yeah, and, and a lot of that sort of in part elevation driven by, at least here in the West, in part it's elevation driven and driven in part by those temperature and rain, rain snow transition. So it's, it's interesting, I have a project actually in Colorado. Um, so you go down into the Great Basin and even down into sort of the lower foothills outside of Boise and there we talk about grasslands encroaching into sagebrush steppe ecosystems. You know, so um, cheat grass in particular, which was an invasive before and climate change and the impact of climate change on the fire cycle um, making it easier for cheatgrass to outcompete um, native sagebrush. Um, so that's one that we're already seeing and, and have has saw before and climate change has sort of made it worse. My colleagues in Colorado and maybe even some folks up here, um, so we have a project that's up in the East, um, the East River, which is a, um, a tributary of the Gunnison. Um, there they talk about shrub encroachment into, um, into into forest stands. Um, and that's something that we also sort of might see as well, right? And, you know, we, we right here are very much on that sort of, um, you know, uh, sage, sage um, tree transition. And so, yeah, I would imagine that going forward that there, there's, you know, and, and what that looks like is not necessarily sort of a gradual shift in veget of, you know, shrublands encroaching into forests. What that might look like, right, is that, you know, the next time a fire burns a stand that's kind of a mix of trees and sagebrush um, or that the trees just can't come back, right? They can't outcompete the sagebrush. And so a lot of these shifts um, are gradual when you zoom out to the scale of the whole Western U.S. But if you look at any individual, um, you know, piece of land, it could sort of happen in the span of a year, a year or so. Um, so, but yeah, we, we definitely do, and that's, that's a whole area of, of um, research that's also of interest is, you know, how do, you know, and there's actually this discussion of what's called, um, uh, I can't, managed or forced migration, right, of, um, of basically figuring out, I think of this as sort of like from a vegetation or a restoration perspective, skating where the hockey puck is going, right? Um, figuring out what, where the climate will stabilize and then kind of starting to do restoration work to kind of put those species um, in what their kind of potential climate will be in the future. So, but yeah, there, we, we expect some, some compositional shifts in our ecosystems going forward and yeah, it's the east is hard too because there's there's a lot of really interesting things about um, you know the the different tree species in the east and it's kind of like legacy um, of landscape change with settlement as well. So, uh, do you think we can expect a, a phase change in climate and we'll wake up to the Eocene one morning? Yeah. So, um, so the um, the the question is you know. Can we expect sort of a, um, is there, are there potential for sort of very rapid shifts in climate? Um, and um, that's one thing that we're, you know, that we're, we're very sort of keen to know. And, and I don't know that we necessarily, there I would sort of defer in some level to my paleo colleagues because um, um, on, on, on one level, you know, increasing evidence that Earth's climate in the past has changed without the presence of humans in the span of up to, you know, like maybe 50 years or so. Um, um, I don't know that I necessarily have, it's, it's really interesting to think, of, think through what the mechanisms are that would prompt such a rapid transition. Um, some, some ones that sort of I worry about, right, are, are 
tremendous scale fires and the impact on on not just CO2 but like aerosols, right? And um, you know, uh, Australia, like it's still 2020, but if you recall early 2020, the first year of 2020, um, Australia was mostly on fire, right? Like that was, you know, um, and you know, the big story lately has been a, a lot of big fires in the um, uh, in Siberia. And those are particularly worrying because they're on top of very, very large methane stores. Methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. So it's, it's things like that that really kind of worry me when I see, you know, like fires that are order of size of, you know, an entire U.S. state um, in places like Siberia. I start to go, ooh, that, that can't possibly be good. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I you know, it, I think that the possibility is out out there, and I think that that is something that that the community is is kind of fervently working, or at least one part of the community is fervently working to try and understand what what are those things that can result in rapid rapid transitions of, of the climate state. So, if I was to play devil's advocate and say I'm a climate denier, I'm a climate change denier, how would you most quickly or most easily synopsize how you would convince me that I should be a climate change believer? Um, you know, I, um, and, and there's, um, there's whole um, conversation programs that some of us go through to kind of have those conversations. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the big, one of the things that, that we're taught in some of these kind of climate communication seminars and stuff is is really in um, you know and I, I think our colleagues in in public health are now um, encountering these very same you know like discussions um, with masks um, but you know a lot of it I think is trying to um, frequently just just have kind of discussions with people on a one to one basis that is a that's trying to get to the root of what the concerns with um, you know, with uh, with what you know, what the concerns are of, of if the climate is changing, right? Because I think that frequently that comes with a sort of implied. Then we have to do something, right? If the climate is changing, then we have to do something, and it's often what's being expressed is that part, right? Is is the worry about how either my individual behavior, or my community's behavior might have to change, or things that I might lose. Um, and I think that once you get to some of those kind of, um, you know, some of those concerns, and, the, you know, I think that some of those concerns, those concerns are legitimate, right? Um, and uh, about the how I will, you know, what, what will I lose? Um, but I think that once you pivot the conversation in that regard, when you, when you start sort of getting to kind of the, the motivations and sort of some of the, the kind of, you know, bread and butter concerns of people, then you can start to actually engage them in, in the conversation and in part of the solution, right? Which is that like, look, I, you know, I still want to go to Thailand at some point in my life. And, um, and so I, I don't want to restrict people's travel. I don't want to sort of impose hard mandates on how many, you know, um, how many plane trips anybody can take. Um, I still like steak. Um, you know, so, so it becomes more of the question of like, well, how do we realize that, you know, what is it that we're worried about losing and, and, and how can we figure out a way to preserve what that's about while sort of changing potentially its impact on the climate system? I'm curious because a lot of people, well, there's kind of a sex people about with climate change saying that like geoengineering is the solution, like putting chemicals in the upper atmosphere, putting iron in water. I wonder from like a hydrological standpoint, what your thoughts on that are, but also like how would that affect, if we did like a massive geoengineering uh, technique like that, how would that affect smaller communities like this? That's a great question. And so the question is about geoengineering, right? So. Um, as, as climate change sort of progresses and as it becomes more evident, right, there is a desire, um, and all of us have this experience right now, right, um, of, of what is that silver bullet that's going to end the pandemic, right? And it's the, same, it's the same thing. 
what is the silver bullet that's, that can solve climate change? And so we reach for things like, um, you know, like in, you know, injecting, you know, um, highly reflective particles into the upper atmosphere to reflect solar radiation. Um, yeah, dumping iron into the ocean. Um, if my take on a lot of those is that if we get to having to use those solutions, something has gone very wrong, like far in advance of that. Um, they potentially work at the global scale, but you're absolutely right that we don't know what the ramifications are um, at, at for individual communities. Um, we don't, you know, we don't know. Um, we have some idea of what dumping a bunch of iron into the ocean could do, um, but what does that do to uh, um, to marine ecosystems? And and what is that? You know, how do those um, impacts propagate out onto the food supply, onto you know a variety of other things? And so, um, I think that geoengineering will be kind of continued to be researched because, on some level, it is important to kind of you know, investigating geoengineering actually can help us un better understand the processes themselves, right? So in trying to understand how dumping iron into the ocean works, we need to refine our understanding of how the ocean works and, you know, its, um, eco its ecology and its biogeochemistry. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of sort of investigating them because they help us learn more about those systems. But my take is that, like, we should, you know, if at all possible, um, we should do what we can to not have to get to using that, you know, that weapon in the, in the toolkit. Yeah, so um, the, the the question is about, so this is the whole, the term for it is climate induced migration, right? And so, um, so the, the, there are a lot of questions about, you know, what, um, at the global scale, certainly, and, and even there's quite a few three letter agencies that are worried about that very question in places like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, um, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, because of the national security ramifications it have has, but certainly in the United States, even right.